new to this session, let me introduce myself. My name is John Dixon. I'm director of Coral Studies at LSU. I direct the uh, master's and doctoral programs there. Long time Baptist, uh, taught at Southern Seminary for about 15 years, graduate of Baylor, and uh, too many years ago to talk about. But, uh, it's really nice to be here. My first time, actually, since I, I taught here at Baylor in 82 to 84, so it's nice to, nice to be back. Uh, I think this is one of the most important um, things maybe that, that has worked for me, I'll say that, and that I can hopefully share with you. And some of you already do this, and some of you have already been in sessions um, from Weston Noble to many others uh, that talk about voicing. Um, what I know is who we stand by makes a difference. Who we sing by makes a difference. And the more we can help our ensemble and whole. Uh, <clears throat> what's your philosophy of choral tone? There's really only two principles that I think um, apply to blend. Uh, I'll give you those in the handout. Either <clears throat> you embrace a single tonal model that you ask every other singer in your choir to get as close to as possible and to match the voice to the subjugation of their own voice. Uh, examples of that would be as extreme as the old St. Olaf uh, before Anton to the old Westminster with John Fenley Williams. Both of those completely different tones still had the same concept and that is they have a particular tonal model that they want all the voices to, to connect with. With Westminster, the principle is broad. It just said all these rich, big post-World War II voices, which is what that developed, just sing and pin your ears back. I remember here, hearing a um, Bach cantata with Frank McKinley was at University of North Texas. And my God, it was the most thrilling, exciting, loud, non-Bach thing I ever heard. <laughs> It was like a 747 just landing right in the head, but you never forgot. <laughs> the old St. Olaf, of course, you find one model that pairs everything down to a very pure sound and ask all of your singers to, to do that. I think that is harmful to the voice. I think it is not conducive to good vocal development in the collegiate setting, in the volunteer church setting, in the community or whatever. We should be about helping our singers to become better singers with better technique because we all benefit by that. So I would suggest that the second model is what I would encourage, the development of the individual singer and creating your blend out of the collective timbres of your singers. Now, I will say again and again, yes, I am in a fortunate position to be able to audition my choir and have a 50 Three boys, LSU a cappella choir, where I can pretty much, not always, uh, <clears throat> choose a particular timbres of voices to create my whole. But even in that setting, it's a relative thing. You may not have the tenors up here. You, you may have a particular sound, but it doesn't matter if you don't have those particular timbres available. How much more does that trickle down to our uh, amateur choirs where in church you can't even guarantee that you'll have a tenor section sometimes. Uh, much less the, the quality of those voices. And as people age in church, they tend to stay in choirs longer than in school because we just flunk them out. <laughs> so, uh, here is my thesis. The consequence of constructing one's choral tone from the collective blend of the individual timbres with emphasis on developing the singer is a critical need for voicing each section of the choir <clears throat> so as to position every singer for maximum contribution and effective blend. Maxima, now sometimes you can get effective blend but you may not get maximum contribution. You want the maximum contribution out of every singer. The most lyric, fluidious, lightest, almost heard voice you still want to have that person make a contribution to your full dramatic soprano. But how do you do that and integrate that in such a way? So the term voicing for me is applied to choral singers and it refers to 
placement of each singer in the best possible acoustical environment in relationship to other singers. I never ever, unfortunately, saw Weston do his voicing thing. I learned my voicing uh, from Weston Kaufman at Dallas Baptist College in 1971 when I came in as a freshman and the first thing he did in that first week was he lined us all up and he voiced us both by section and by quartet. And we had those partners, stand partners, throughout the year. And it was about a two-day process as he did that. What I gained from that was, was an ear that understood how voices pair and how they don't pair together. To the point that now, whether it's my professional choir in Atlanta, chamber choir that I do, Coral Bacotti, or it's LSU, or it's a choir that I'm doing this Saturday in Oxford, England, which is a 26 voice professional choir of uh, people that I've known through the years that have learned 40 pieces of music with my marquees that have never sung together and are going to show up at Oxford on Sunday, and we have uh, three, six, nine, we have 10 hours of rehearsal before we get into it, and we'll, walk, we'll come together on Sunday and say, oh, this is what we sound like. That's exciting. And it scares the hell out of me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, this is true. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, but I love, this is, this is so Western and so perfect. You simply have to hear people together. You can't accurately, accurately predict place. My goal is to have every single person comfortable with the person on each side. In essence, I don't ask the singers to conform to one model voice. I am after uniformity, but not conformity. What help me? What does that say to me? I am after, in my choir, I'm after uniformity, but not conformity. Can you have both? You want them to sound. You want them to sound uniform, but that's you don't have a rigid goal to which you're shooting. Right. Lee. So we want a uniform ensemble. We want a tenor, a soprano section, ideally to sound as close to one voice as you can. But you won't, don't want everyone conforming to the same vocal model. You want to use as much of that timbre as you can. Uh, so uh, there's no there's no magic. So I wish I could tell you that there was a formula, but there's really not. It's just taking a bunch of singers and, and hearing them together. Now before, I usually do this at the end, so you don't turn me off. Let me say this. I've voiced church choirs all my life. It's the hardest part of voice. Amen. Because, yeah, because they, they, change, they change every Wednesday or every Sunday and for the most part, for the first thing, you can't. Have you ever gotten your entire church choir together at one, at one time? I did it one time in my life. I, I absolutely had a hard time. I said, I said, we're going to voice on September 14th of 19 whatever it was. I told them at Christmas, I said, put it in your book and we're going to have a retreat. And we came that day and every single person showed up. And we voiced. Now the next Sunday have them gone, but, but we voiced. Yeah. Uh, but I'm telling you, it is so critical because if you have a master plan, even if you have this whole on Sunday, you at least have the others that have sung together and you know where to fill in holes here and there as well. So, um, so let's, um, I, don't, uh, I don't care, let's start with uh, baritones. Let me have baritones come up here. Thanks, baritones. Come up. You don't need anything. Just come up. Just a, a one kind of semicircle here. Doesn't matter how you arrange. <clears throat> now, um, you can use anything you want, but first of all, it, it probably needs to be a unison, not parts. And I think it needs to be in a singable medium range. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you want them to be as at ease as possible. Most people know my country tis of me. Except when I we went to Britain and then we did God's <laughs> uh, So, let's do it. Uh, with the bass and the altos, I do it in F major. So, uh, that's C major. How about that? So, uh, let's take a listen to that. One, two, three. 
my country tis of the sweet land of liberty of thee I sing land where my fathers died land of the pilgrim's pride from every mountainside let freedom ring and if you'd like to have this place here yeah. By the way, feel free to move. If you're on the outside, you may not hear everything. Uh, you may want to come down here to the middle, stand in front of the wall. Uh, the first thing I listen for are voices that I would say that have light timbres or parrots. And I also listen for voices that are being canceled out to a certain extent, although I don't know these voices. Okay, so Davis, here's what I hear on the first tier. Who, is, who do you hear is the biggest voice in the system? One of Paul these guys. Or Ted? One of these guys. Yeah, one of these guys. I think it's, I think I it's him. him. Yeah. It's Ted, Ted has the brighter voice. And they're both very big. Ted has probably the brightest voice. No. Cuts one. There is somewhere between Jim and David, there's a bit of, of what I would say cancellation. Oh, here's another thing. I'm going to start with from Jerry Jim. Hang on. So the first time I did this with church, I did my small chamber ensemble, and I started talking about how dull Vicky's voice sounded. Uh, at which point, Vicky ran out of the room in tears. And then I said, I forgot to tell you what I truly meant was, it, we're not talking about anybody's voice, we're talking about how your voice sounds as affected by the other voices. I never got a back. <laughs> so be careful about that. This is not personal. This is acoustical. All right. So what I'm hearing is, I think there's some cancellation going on here. I think there's some rounder kind of. Uh, I think I actually could probably match Steve and Paul together, and that would be a good start. Mm -hmm. So let's just do that. We'll swing Paul to the end here. Move down this way. Still don't know what we're going to do about that. Let's just try it again. Kind of pitch. One, two. My country is of the sweet land of liberty, of the I sing. Yep. Did you hear more presence in that sound? Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, the sound to me now goes this way. Uh -huh. Right? Now these aren't small voices, but I'm saying they are what I would I try three classifications, which are very general. Flute. Oboe, or sorry, flute, reed, double reed, and color voice. So a, a voice can be big and still be a reedy voice. Uh, Ted has that good forward presence of sound that gives that kind of a, a brighter sound. These guys have full voices, but they have a roundness to it that is a bit more toward that mellow or flute sound. Uh, and but you also say that the color voice is the one that is probably your most dramatic or roundest or largest voice, which again would probably be Ted or maybe Paul uh, in certain arrangements. Now we haven't done anything with Bill. The Davis's voice sounded different in that arrangement than he did in a, a moment ago. You again may not hear the things that I hear this close, but <laughs> But I, I really do encourage you, please move, because if you don't hear some of this, it won't make it, you just taking my advice. Come in the center, come right around right here. Uh, now, so now we're just thinking, we're really looking for, I'm looking for the best unison that I can get without taking the color of the voice out. You know, we can sing a unison. Guys, sing again. I want you to take all the Barato out. I want you to mix a little bit more air with it. And let's sit. Here we go. Ready? And My country tis of the sweet land of liberty, of the I sing. My country tis of the sweet land of liberty, of the I see. So that's going back to principle number one. I can get
get them all the, very quickly. They get a nice intonation and a pretty blend. But it's blend is black. Oh, why? Yeah, well, why? It's black. Why would you do that when you have this kind of power and color and beauty to the sound? I was hoping to use that word. Yeah. <laughs> but I was hoping that way. <laughs> So, use the color, but find a position for it where you can integrate so you hear both the best unison without hearing certain voices uh, out of context. So let's, without talking too much, play a bit with the middle. Bradley, I'd like you and David to switch. And Ted, I'd like you and Jim to switch. Alright, here we go again. Ready? One, two. My country is of the sweet land of liberty. Of the I see. Do you have many individual voices you're hearing now? Mm -hmm. uh, you're not hearing Jim at all. No. He's completely lost. Uh, you're hearing a couple of big voices in here, but there's, we've lost probably 30% of our blend mm -hmm. yep. by moving two people yep. right. and by saying nothing. Wow. I mean, this is fascinating. Yeah. All right, so you just switch back. Okay. And you just switch back. And we might just make one shift with Jim and Dave. Let's just try this one. Ready? One, two, and go. My country is of the sweet land of liberty, of the I see. What I hear now is you have two different sounds. You have this sound, and you have this sound. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah? That's right. Yeah. Okay, so make sure you're, you're actually with me. Yeah. Yeah. You heard, you, so it's not as unified, it's still good. It's still vibrant, still colorful, but it's not quite. So just know that there are, life is a series of trade-offs. That's it. For every bit of trade-off for color, you get an easier blend. For every bit you trade off a blend, you get more color. You've got to find that balance where you get the most out of the voice. And the other thing is, you've got voices that have not been able to sing their voice because of the wrong, have you ever sung in a, in a community or oratorial chorus mm -hmm. where you just kind of sat down and you sang that and you thought, this is not my voice. <laughs> <laughs> or I can't even hear my voice tonight. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about why that happens in a minute. Uh, I voiced a professional choir in England, uh, the, the joyful company voices Peter Broadbent's group. And there's a fabulous bass uh, from Wales, just a great singer. And he came up afterwards and he said, I've been with this group five years, and this is the first time I have ever felt freedom to sing. Mm -hmm. And even though I was a good singer, he was being, he was having to push, kind of, you know, put that voice in the box because of the voices next to him, and he felt like he couldn't sing out. What I'm trying to do is breathe space into this acoustic mm -hmm. so that they can sing their own voice, but they're also listening. Now, there's a lot of processes about this. One is, the more we do it, the more you're beginning to listen. One of the greatest advantages of doing uh, voicing at the beginning of a year is that everyone gets to hear everybody's voice without having to sing a solo. So you then know the qualities. I didn't know Ted's voice before I heard it, but now I do. And I didn't, I didn't hear Jeff's voice until I got into this place here. So as you're doing that, the singers are hearing one another. How ridiculous, but how common is it for our choirs to sing for years together in a section and never really know all of the voices around them? You know, now again, the open door with church is that changes all the time. But you've got to start somewhere. So let's move these guys back one more time. Um, I would like you to switch back. And yeah, let's hear it one last time. I think this is the best arrangement for this for this group. Here we go. One, two, and go. My country is of the sweet land of liberty of the I see. You know how easy that is for them? Yeah. And how what what it put about this much dome of harmonic on it. So you've got that spin up there, and nobody's having to work too hard. <clears throat> I like it, give hand. <laughs> Sopranos. Let's be brave. Sopranos. Here we go. <laughs> Wait.
good to see you. Good to see you. All right, while they're coming, let's talk about some uh, some ways that you can shortcut this. Okay. Just any order, by the way. There's one absolute universal truth about church choir work. Most of you get one shot a week at them, and to even think about taking time to do something like this is absolutely ridiculous when you've got a Sunday anthem and, and service to sing. So I do it in a retreat. Uh, it gets us away from the church. It's a time when people are a bit more relaxed, more comfortable, willing to try. I mean, remember, you've got... Virginia, 82 years of age, sung with the choir for 40 years, and hasn't moved off that front row. <laughs> I had her at Highland, and God rest her soul. I said, Virginia, don't you think it's try time to try alto? And she said, I can't do alto. And I said, okay. She's about four foot, whatever. And she sat right there, but on the front row. So I couldn't put her in the back of the street. Talked about that. Uh, so I thought she's short, and our pastor sits right here. He's pretty tall, and so for the next two years, Phil had a permanent part right down his head where Virginia would hit that sound right in the back. It was the best devil I ever had. So use your pastor for a lot of things. Uh, uh, so. Try to do this in a <coughs> retreat setting, and um, oh, and another shortcut for this. It is good, and I would certainly suggest to the church choir that everybody sit and hear each section because you're also getting to know the other sections. In a university setting, where time is also of of the essence with the challenging stuff that we do, is that I do section rehearsals and give three other rooms with my section leaders and I can go to the Sopranos and work with them for 25 minutes or so and literally just round robin and I can get a 50 voice choir voice within an hour and 20, 30 minutes sometimes. Uh, I was, on my second sabbatical in Cambridge, I was the associate uh, director with David Hill for the Bach Choir in London. And so David gave me, it was the first year he took over from Wilcox, and he gave me 40 of the best singers of the Bach Choir to go to Paris and do a, a, a concert with John Nelson and the Paris Orchestra. And uh, while I was over there, I still wasn't pleased with the blend that I voiced a little bit on that. Well, they came back to David with all these great ideas about voicings. So I got a call one night, one night John, <laughs> let's voice the Bach Choir Monday night. David, that's 220 people. You can't do that in one night. But we did it in four consecutive Mondays where he would put them in section and work a single section. And so you can also pace it out. And to this day, 225 people, David Hill voices the Bob Choir because of that, of that process. Not because of me, because of the process. When one hears it, and your singers here, they will not want to sing without me. It makes a difference. Okay, so Brown's proved me right now. Uh, G major. Here we go. One, two. My country is a Reaching. Reaching. 
team. Okay, good. Now let me hear you four. The, or the others I haven't heard. You two that I just heard over here. Why are you coming to each other? So let me hear, let me hear you three now. Everybody ready? What? Two and go. My country. Now, Sarah, Regina, and Myra, let me hear you. Right, here we go. One, two, and go. My country tis of the sweet land of liberty of the I see. Sarah, will you go in the middle and Regina on the side? Ready? One, two, and go. My country tis of the sweet land of liberty. Some change there. So, of these three, who would you take out to move to the other side right now? Regina. Okay, so Regina, you come over here. So, Sarah, let's leave my over here. Now, let's hear you five. It only becomes a problem when you keep moving just one person around. <laughs> it's very biblical. They say, Lord, is it I? <laughs> right, here we go. Five. Ready? And go. My country. Sometimes when you get really bright timbres with both of these, you want to put a flute or something like that in between to get soften both sounds more. So um, first of all, let's just hear them all together here to see what this sounds like. Ready? One, two, and go. My Is it acoustical? Mm -hmm. It couldn't be acoustical. We hear better out of one ear. You, when a phone rings or whatever, you listen one ear better than the other. And so I think we hear sometimes and adjust more uh, with sounds as well. Um, so I'm going to take this group, which I think I like these three paired together. And I'm going to start with um, Carol, Denise, and Hortensia in that order. One, two, three. Ladies, swing around this one. And then uh, I'm going to think about. Uh, let's hear you four together, yeah, if you don't mind. Ready? One, two, and go. My country tis of the sweet land of liberty of the I see. Right. So just for granted, let's put Sarah in between here, and let's put Regina here and Misty on the side. All right? Here we go. One. My country tis of the sweet land of liberty of the I see. Okay. So let's take Misty and Regina and put you in the middle here and then swing Sarah down here. So we've got ultimately just kind of reversed this whole thing now. Let's try this. Ready? One, two, and go. My country tis of the sweet land of Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, you heard, uh, no, I'm going to say it. Tell me. You, you neutralized a lot of the unique voices that were sticking out initially. You neutralized them and got them in a place where they now they actually blend very nicely with the rest. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially when they went to the very higher note. Right. It was interesting where, when Sarah was over here, she was sticking out. Right. And then flipped her to the other side. Right. Just by flipping her to the other side. Mm -hmm. she, sorry. Yeah. And just, just a reminder, because we all. If I'm a singer and I hear the word that my voice has been neutralized, <laughs> I know what you mean. I'm just like, think about it. Because, yeah, there's neutralized, or I would put this person in a better place so that that voice could be reinforced. You see, neutralized implies that we're trying to just put a buffet or a blanket over the voice. You, know, you want to put that voice where you contribute without sticking out. That's what I'm trying to do. What else? I could sense that the singers felt better at the end. You, you heard each other better? What happened? Yes. Yeah. There's, There's a difference. So there was unity in the tone, right? Yeah. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You feel like you're singing together. Let's hear more from the singers. Talk to me more about what you felt in different places. Well, I knew that we had strong voices that were similar. And I was wondering how that was going to work uh -huh. out. But it's interesting because we're yeah. still together, but we're in the middle. In the middle now. Yeah. Right. So yeah. there is yeah. some right. sense of the brighter the voice, I do not want an overly bright voice on the outside because that voice tends to stick out. But that voice can make a real contribution in the center where you may have a dramatic voice that is over singing or, or is more colorful than it's sticking out. Sometimes that, that, that bright voice can put a, a focal point or a or, or, yes, focus. Yeah, can focus the voice. What else did you all hear? Any differences? Well, I couldn't hear. I couldn't hear us very much. But when they sang, I heard them very. I mean, uh -huh. right. So I believe that's a good thing or bad thing. Collectively, it's a good thing. And and don't expect that you're going to have everybody perfectly happy uh, or hearing exactly what you hear. You've got to say, trust me. Like a voice teacher, you can't hear your own voice. You have to trust it. So trust me that collectively it sounds really good. Now I've had singers plenty of times come and say, I just. I know your voice and we may sound good, but I can't sing by so and so. Mm -hmm. Well, then you've got, to, you've got to accommodate. You don't want somebody just miserable. Um, but some things that I heard were we heard lots more individual vibratos in the earlier stage. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm hardly aware of the vibrato now. They have not cut the vibrato out. They centered the vibrato. Mm -hmm. I think Anton uses that term, to center the vibrato. But by getting, there's a lot of things that play, particularly in the women's voice in the upper range. Um, it is hearing in the best ear, but it's vibrato rates. Uh, if you get a, if you got faster vibratos, you've got slower, you've got some old aging singers that don't have the, the muscular control, and that becomes sometimes more wobble than vibrato. Yeah. There's all kinds of vibrato. Say again. A yo. <laughs> uh, but what we're trying to do is put, yeah, put singers in a space where it gives them the most freedom to be at their best, basically. And um, so you can tell as we went on through the process, first of all, I think any singers are a little defensive. You know, you move me, oh my God, he's moved me twice. You know, I must, I must be the one, you know, or whatever. So you've got to disarm that a little bit and move enough different people around and let them hear different things where they begin to get the idea of what you're trying to do. And then for any group, bass, baritone, soprano, whatever, the more times you do this, the more you all are each making individual adjustments that you're not even necessarily aware of. But you're doing it as good musicians because you know that you're trying to create that. That, that unison. But nothing is more miserable than a section mismatched, wanting to do their best, but a conductor constantly saying, uh, more, more unison, more blend, more you're, you're flat, or whatever. This certainly also affects intonation as well. Um, and um, so, uh, other questions from, from our soprano, Shelly? Yeah. I was going to ask what you do when you have this and now you have to put this in two rows, not yep. one. We'll talk about that in a minute. But ladies have a seat. Thank you very much.
Before we try some tenors, let's uh, let's talk about voice formations and and I say the same thing about voice formations that I do about voicing. I have no formula. It's what my ear tells me, and I will not only use different formations with the Ellis Shop Telequire from maybe the fall to the spring. I may change formations three or four times in the semester until I get what I want. And I might even go further to say that depending on the repertoire that I'm doing, I might actually change formations in a particular, if I was doing a concert or a more extended group of pieces with varied styles, I might actually change that as well. Um, I have a, so, before you voice, the very first thing you do is simply determine how many rows are required. Because you don't need to be voicing until you have a pretty good idea of how it's all going to lay out. Now, I had two rows in Highwood. Intimate church, wood, stone, hundred and something years old, beautiful acoustic, but a small loft. So, a big semicircle of, of two rows here. So, I had to decide Am I going to do block, soprano, alto, tenor, bass? Am I going to do a four square of women front, men back? You know, that sort of thing. You've got to decide that. Um, if you have a long string that you voice, and then you want to break them up into two rows, then it would be possible to do part of this and then take this part, if this is your more colorful, fuller sound, and put them behind them. Then you got, I mean, the matrix is infinite. And then you do that, you may say, oh, well, that screwed that up. Now I've got to start. Yeah. But if you have time, you can still move people uh, around. Um, the only, uh, I guess, um, principles that I try, uh, lyric, light, flute voices need to be in the front row. Um, I don't put my best singers or my best sight readers in the front just to be heard. I'm, I work only tonal, and that's in church too. If you put lighter voices back there, they might as well go home. They're not, they're not heard. So, so I put those, um, those lyric voices in the front, and then I build back so that my sound usually goes from front to back like that. And then, usually from left to right, it goes like that. So that's one rule. The other rule is I do like my sopranos and basses to be next to each other. The tuning is you get the top and you get the, the, the foundation or the root of that. Usually that works. So in order to do that, I do a lot of block formations. And so, so I would have um, a fan shape like that. And that lets you have four rows. Uh, but I will often have soprano and bass here, and then put my inner voices on the out. That way it gives you, it keeps men together and women together. It gives you the top and the root together, and it gives the interior voices that are often lost a bit more space on the outside to be heard. Now that sounds all good in theory, but in Atlanta with Coral Bacani, I've tried that three times, and every time I have to go back and move my uh, altos inside because I've lost them on the outside. So it just it just depends. Um, but I think I think position I think formations are critical. I do not worry about sidelines. I just don't. There's, I can't think of any configuration, loft, or whatever that you cannot create windows. And uh, so if you, if, if, every, if, if appearance is more important to you than sound, then get them perfectly lined out by height and all of that, and they'll look great. But chances are they won't sound as good as they could if you voice them. So, I mean, I've got five foot whatever on the third row sometimes, and I'll have to move people and wedge, and there are limitations. I've got, I have a couple of trees in Texas Tech, my two altos, six foot 
<laughs> what hours? <laughs> oh my God! We have to begin. The facts. <laughs> I had, I had to voice it to the outside, to the very end, so that they could at least be on the outside and not just cover up about half my minutes. Uh, but uh, there, are, there are limitations at height, but that's not, what I, that's not what guides me. What guides me is the sound that works best. Another theory is to, uh, you put your uh, best sight readers by your people that can't read. Well, likely those people that can't read are not producing a whole lot of sound anyway, for the most part. That's, you can, I can think of many exceptions, but for the most part. And so you're really putting a good voice next to one that doesn't contribute as much, and you're hurting some of the good, uh, good voice. I'm saying I don't do it as a principle, but I end up that way with the voice. Um, and I don't put all my best voices right along the front. It's kind of a front line of defense. Um, you know, I, I, I spot them out so I move them around. So. Dramatic voices next to each other can complement each other in color. More times than not, they beat each other up. <laughs> you got two dramatic sopranos with two different vibratos. That's better entertainment than a sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> sponsor and changed my life for somatic and England. And when he first came to work with somatic Clark Southern, this was in my full tone years before I had a little bit of finesse with the British sound. And uh, he, he had a couple of sayings. Uh, he was working on the lessons of Carol Sanders. Sopranos, if you must wobble, would you wobble on this side of the pitch rather than that? <laughs> And then we got really impatient. You have these constantly rolled arms. Oh, I wish you'd get rid of that wretched vibrato. <laughs> <laughs> so vibrato, intonation, uh, hearing, uh, and then acoustical. Now, I can't prove the scientific, but I do have some idea that um, that the overtone system of partials, uh, when, we, when we sing a fundamental and no overtones, which we can't do, but when you imagine a fundamental, and we know the system of octave, fifth, fourth, and so forth as the, as the system goes up. Um, what's happening is that, that like reinforces like. And dissimilar does not fill in the blanks. It actually, like a sine wave out of sync, cancels out. So if Davis, which I didn't hear much in that one area, had a particular set of partials that was that was emphasized more, let's say more the odd number partials, and Jim next to him had an even set of partials in the size, rather than filling in, they were actually physically canceling out voice and sound as it goes out. Whereas when you heard pairings that worked like Paul and Steve together on the end, I suspect that there are more similarities of overtones in those voices so they complement one another. A better way of imagining it is this. When, when we do Russian choral music, one of the great things about singing a Chesnikov let thy holy presence, or or something like that, is that you get a system of diatonicism that is tonic, third, fifth, octave, third, fifth, octave, tonic, whatever, and it's just over and over emphasizing the the triad system. Okay, if that's the case, then those those that, those triads, by their very nature of consonants, have more overtones in. In, um, in in sync, in collaboration with, in common with each other, then if I added a minor second or a ninth or even a seventh, but particularly a ninth or an eleventh. So when you hear Russian sonority, 
and you hear this full, rich kind of body of, body of sound, that is in part the divisis, but it's also the overtones reinforced by each other in that triadic system. Now, go to today's, what I call, cluster harmonists. From Whitaker to Lawrenson to Paulus to all the second generation of them, cluster harmony, by its very nature, takes a triad, a diatonic triad, and then adds a ninth. Eric's favorite chord is an F9 chord. So you get an F, A, C, skip the E, and then go to the ninth. F, right? F, mm -hmm. A, C, and then G, G would be the ninth, uh, which is working against the root uh, of, of the F. So, this is fascinating. I don't need to say more. For example, Texas Tech Choir, we did, uh, we did some of Eric's music, and we were his demonstration choir at TMEA. And we had, we had almost memorized Leonardo Briggs and the Slime Machine. And uh, I said, guys, we know this so well. I said, wouldn't it be fun? Let's just jumble up. So we got out of our sections and mixed up in quartets. And we began singing. And I kept stopping. I said, that's a wrong note. Altos, you missed that. What's going on? This, is, this isn't right. This is, we're singing the right notes. No, you're not. We're singing the right notes. What was the problem? Balance. If I'm an alto in an F9 chord, and I've got the G, and I have an alto here, 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 and here, then none of them hear collectively what the section is doing. So they over sing to hear the ninth. And then you hear the you hear the color, you hear the non-chordal tone, the ninth more than you hear the triad, and then you lose all context of the chord, and it just sounds like a jumble of nothing. You've got a cluster harmony, you've got to hear the triad, and then a just cherry topping of a ninth or an eleventh. Don't ever let that note be as loud dynamically as a triad, or it doesn't, it doesn't blend. Either. We went back to sections, I didn't have to say a word, because they heard them the balance. So when I do cluster music, we take a long time to get those kind of tunings and balance. It doesn't happen. So going back to our voicing, I think what's happening is that we have a dissimilar system of partials. If we're by a voice that's canceling our sound out, as opposed to a pairing, which is light, reinforcing light. So those of you in, in vocal science can tell me that that's ridiculous, or physics can say that's, that makes no sense. But I do know that the sound coming out of my mouth, those waves have to interact with the other waves coming out of other singers. And there has to be a relationship of physical physics, acoustical physics that are going on with the interaction of those waves. You come into a room that has a good acoustic. You hear a particular sound partly because of the vocalic resonance of your own acoustic. Then you hear what this acoustic adds to the voice. Then why wouldn't the sound going out among us have influences of sound waves and acoustical connection? All right, we have time for either tenors or altos. Let's vote. How many of you want to hear the tenors? Raise your hands. Tenors. How many of you want to hear the altos? Raise your hands. <laughs> Come on, tenors. Here we go. Yeah. All right, this time, I'm going to let you make the choices, all right? That's a good question. Can you do the comparing of voices within a SATV formation? I mean, like, you're going to, like, mix. Ah, okay, let's do that. Uh, Wesley's other type of voicing that he taught me, this could be interesting, is he would also, he would do the voicing of quartets differently than he did the sectional voicing. Here's what he'd do. He would take the voice closest to the fundamental. The lightest, flutiest, most fundamental voice with not much overtone, not much color, not much size. And he would build it as that being number one and number twelve being the most dramatic. And he would line them up that way, number them off, 
And once he did that, there are your quartets. Number one, number one soprano, number one alto, number one tenor, number one bass. You are quartet number one, and you are here. Number two quartet here, number three here, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Sound goes this way, sound goes that way. Yep. Now, with mature singers like this, we may not have anybody close to singing fun than that. But let's see what we do. G major for tenor two. Two. One, two. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Let me hear just you two, if you don't mind. Ready? Two, three, go. My heart. 
bigger, more colorful voices. Um, good. Uh, any questions? Oh, boy. Well, yes. Uh, lateral space. Yeah. Between singers. If you have a recommendation between lateral space. Yeah, if you have space in your law, I would like a full, small body space between each singer. You can get two spaced out so that they're not blending and hearing, but, but when you're all cramped up in a lot of roads and no space between, you can't get blend them. It just sucks the sound down. Give your singer some space to sing it. Quick questions, others? Yes. <laughs> the difference between, let's say you have a small part. Yeah. Do it with 15, 18? Yeah. Okay. When you're singing dramatic or fuller, yeah. four, four part, yeah. then all of a sudden unison may be softer. What about the blend that? Do you ask people to adjust more to yes. the of unison? How do you do that? Yeah, I just, first of all, I'll just say, you can adjust more. Folks, you're sticking out. And look, if your choir gets used to it, I say, David's, great sound, give me 20% less. If you do that enough, then nobody takes offense to it. And, and they really begin to appreciate it. They want input, they really do. And so, as long as it's positive. But I, I, I would tell them, yeah, I would tell them that. For those of you that have very few men and a lot more women, uh, sometimes I do a bit of a horseshoe where I put. Uh, uh, tenor and bass here, and then wrap my sopranos and my altos around them with a with one row of space so they can see. So that way you get your men collectively together in the center. Uh, I mean, it's just common sense. You know that. You, you know that. You you do what you do. Uh, I think we're over time, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.